Turn to Exodus 12 to begin. It is a good day to review this time of, of how the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, unfolded for Israel, and we will review that by way of introduction here this morning, before, uh, this afternoon, before getting to our, our main uh, essence of what we want to cover today. Exodus 12, verse 42 uh, Exodus 12, verse 42 is what was uh, read yesterday in both congregations, I believe. It is a night of solemn observance to the eternal for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 12, verse 42. This is that night of the eternal, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. So they left by night, as it's talked about in other passages, and they... uh, left Egypt. Now, verse 43 is interesting, and it gets to a question that uh, the teens asked recently, and we didn't get to that in the Bible study that we covered on uh, baptism, but this uh, addresses uh, this to some degree. Let's read verse 43. Verse 43, And the Eternal said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry uh, any of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break one of its bones, uh, as uh, brought out in John 19, that uh, Jesus Christ's bones were not broken. Uh, All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the eternal, let all his males be circumcised and let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Then all the children of Israel did as the eternal commanded Moses and Aaron So they did. Let's uh, keep your finger there. Let's go over to Colossians really quickly. And this gets to uh, one of the questions that the teens had asked uh, that night. Colossians uh, addresses this this aspect of circumcision. Uh, Colossians 2 verse verse 11. Colossians 2 verse 11. It's stated here, In him, speaking of Jesus Christ, you were also circumcised. But we were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, our baptism uh, represents a burial as as, as you've heard covered here the last uh, several weeks. Buried with him in baptism in which you were raised also with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So one of the things that we, we talk with the, the teens about and a, a person who wants to become baptized is that it is a, a, a matter of a circumcision of the heart, that just as Israel needed to be circumcised, uh, the males, in order to keep the Passover service, so uh, our brethren, uh, to be part of the body of Christ in terms of keeping the, sac- uh, the Passover uh, service, uh, are to be circumcised of heart. They are to receive the baptism and, and, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. That is the circumcision of the heart, and it is an adult decision to make. And so, uh, folks, as they they come to that age of maturity and consider their lives and they consider going forward and the commitment that is tied to that, they make that decision. And uh, through baptism and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, they become circumcised of heart and they keep the Passover. Let's go back now to Exodus 12 and And read one more verse before we uh, move on in the story. Exodus 12, verse 51. And it came to pass that on that very same day that the Eternal brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their hosts. So he did that. He brought them out. And then we come to Exodus 13. Exodus 13, verse 3. Moses said to the people, now remember this day in which you went out of Egypt. This is the first day of unleavened bread. They left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread. Remember, they stayed in in their dwellings that night of Passover, because he said, if you come out that night, uh, you will not do very well, uh, as in you will be very dead. So do not come
come out. So they did not come out that night, but they left that next night. They left by night, but they came out of the, of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, the eternal was the one who brought you out of this place. And then he says, no leavened bread shall be eaten. On this day, you are going out in the month Abed. And it shall be when the Eternal brings you into the land of uh, all of these peoples, in, 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 as he talks about with uh, the land of Canaan, to a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service. You do it in this month. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Eternal, which Mr. Garrett talked about, that we'll be keeping uh, this upcoming uh, Sabbath. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen among you nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you'll tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Eternal did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be a mem uh, as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Eternal's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand it was God, the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt. Keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. They went out of Egypt, and they did it not because of their own strength, but they did it because of the strength of the hand of the Lord. He was the one who brought them out. And, and they said, you know, as they talked to their kids, remember this, I remember this is what the Lord did for me. And, and as he reiterates again in verse 9, this is with a strong hand he brought you out of Egypt. So as we do that, as we remember how God delivered us from Egypt, as we think about our lives now, as we do that, we also remove leavening from our homes and we eat unleavened bread during that time because he was the one who did that for us. He delivered us from slavery. He delivered them from slavery, depravity, sin, and they got out of Egypt quickly. They left Egypt very, very quickly. During the days of unleavened bread, as we know, um, leavening pictures sin. Leavening is an agent that creates a chemical reaction which spreads throughout the dough and puffs up the entire loaf of bread. So we now come to the essence of our discussion today. Let's look in Exodus 13. Now look at verse 17. Exodus 13 and verse 17, and we'll hit a, a key verse here in verse 17, actually, that I'd like to, uh, again, spend most of our focus as we go forward. So it came to pass, so Israel had, had left. He talked about the law of the firstborn here uh, at the first few verses, and then uh, another uh, passage here in verses 11 through 16. But then he says in verse 17, Then it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. So that would have been up along the, the, the border of northeastern Egypt and up toward the, the area of the Philistines, which would have been along the Mediterranean Sea. That would have been the natural path to, to head up and head to, and head to the promised land, uh, the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. That would have been the way to go, but it says he did not do that. And what was his reasoning for doing so? Because this gets uh, to the heart of what we'll discuss. Although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps... In, in all this process, the people change their minds when they see war and they return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way, by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Moses took some of the bones of Joseph, um, which uh, Joseph had made them solemnly promise to bring. Uh, verse 20, so they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. The Eternal went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He, his presence was always with them. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before his people. They knew they were headed to the promised land, but they didn't know the path that he was going to take them, but he did not leave them that entire time. But he said, I'm not going to take them this one way, because that will get in their minds as things get rough. They may turn and want to go back to Egypt. Chapter 14. Chapter 14. So the Eternal spoke to Moses, 
saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pihahirath, and between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh, he's going to say to the children of Israel, look, they're bewildered by, the, by the, the, the land and they're getting all turned around. The wilderness has closed them in. Look, they're getting themselves, they don't even realize they've trapped themselves up against the Red Sea. They're going to be stuck. There's no way out of their situation except to go into the sea, which would be ridiculous, or turn and fight against us, or to turn and say, you're our master, we will return to you. So he says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, verse 4, so that he will pursue them, and I am going to gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Eternal. And they did so. So it was told the king of Egypt that Israel had fled, that they had left Egypt, and the heart of the Pharaoh and his, his servants grew, uh, grew, was turned against them, and, and he had that, that vigor again to go after them. Uh, why have we done this, that we let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready, took his people with him, 600 chariots, all the chariots of Egypt with captains uh, over every one of them, of them, and the Eternal hardened the heart of king of Pharaoh, and he pursued the children with the, with, as Israel had gone out with boldness. They realized God had intervened for them. He had killed the firstborn of, of Egypt, and they came out of Egypt with a high hand, and they came out with a boldness and a confidence. God is with us. He's taking us to the promised land. So here they were as um, the Egyptians pursued them, and they, they, came, they, they came up to uh, Israel then in verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and, and so they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So they left with boldness, and then immediately they're, they're very fearful. Their lives are in jeopardy. Verse 11, then, the, then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die out here in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, Moses? Why did you bring us out of Egypt in the first place? We didn't really even want to leave. Why did you, why did you Moses, take us out of here? And then they make the statement in verse 12. Is this not the word that we, didn't we tell you this before when we were in Egypt? Didn't we let you know we don't want to do this? Just let us alone, Moses, that we may serve the Egyptians. We're, we're okay with that. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians. Think of the imagery here, brethren. It would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die out here in the wilderness. Of course, Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand still. See the salvation of the eternal. The, the salvation which he, this great God, Yahweh, the, the covenant God who has covenanted with his people, will accomplish for you today. For the eternal, uh, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The eternal will fight for you. So hold your peace. Be quiet. Be still. He's, he's going to take care of things. So the Eternal said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children to go forward. Well, what do you mean go forward? Where, what do you mean go, go forward? Go forward into the water? Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They're going to follow in. And then I am going to show the Egyptians and they will see that I am the eternal. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. So it came uh, between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Is Israelites. So it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all night. So we know how that, that proceeds forward as God uh, gains honor over uh, Egypt. Let's drop down to... Verse 26, so the eternal then says to Moses as they've crossed, stretch out your hand and cover the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. So he did that. And, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. 
so the eternal, overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned, they covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. I, uh, my wife was telling me about uh, uh, Paul, and, Paul and Tracy Carter had kept night to be much observed last night and had uh, a family over at their home. And uh, one, I think it was Chelsea or one of, the, one of, the, the, uh, one of them had uh, made as a centerpiece, I don't know if any of you saw this, but one of them had made a centerpiece where uh, they created this, this fold of fabric to, to make it look like uh, the, uh, the, red, the, the, reds, the wall of the Red Sea going all the way down, down the table. And then little little figurines from figurines. That sounds like pagan. No, it wasn't. Fig, it wasn't those kind of figurines. It was just little little tiny people. I don't know if, what were those little ant, uh, little people called in the eighties. The people had those little adult Polly Pockets. Maybe it was, maybe it was Polly Pockets. Some, is Polly Pockets was that an eighties thing? Was that at nineties? Uh, anyway, I, I had girls and I sh we had girls and I can't remember if it was Polly Pockets or there are other little things, but they had little things walking through uh, the Red Sea. They came through the sea uh, very safely, and, but, but then not so with the Egyptians. It came down upon them, and the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Eternal had done. Yes, he had gained honor. The people feared the eternal and believed the eternal and his servant Moses. One of the things that I, I think one of the concepts that we as God's people need to remember as we, as we look at that passage and think about that passage, many of us have, have watched the movie and, or been to Universal Studios and, and seen, seen uh, that small uh, representation of, of what really would have, would have happened. But one was God said, I'm not going to take them the normal way. I'm going to take them a different way. I'm going to push them up against the Red Sea. They're going to cross the Red Sea. Just like he says in 1 Corinthians 10 that Israel was baptized in the Red Sea. They're going to cross the Red Sea. They're going to come up out of the Red Sea. So they come up out of the Red Sea. And then that Red Sea covers the Egyptians. It covers them uh, and the Egyptians which they see no more. Actually, they did see them, uh, but they were dead and they were up on the seashore. Uh, as, as we think of the silence of what water does when water covers something and, and, and something goes down, you hear it no more. It goes down under the water. It was gone. It was completely gone. Think of standing on the other side of that after crossing it and then watching the destruction that occurred from that and seeing the calm take over. Think of the water returning to its normal, uh, original position and, and then seeing these individuals that were your oppressors, uh, ones whom you feared, are no longer there. They're not there. They are not going to bother you or harm you or cause you to be in danger ever, ever again. But that is not the only lesson. One of the lessons that I want to cover today is that what direction did Israel have to go from there? Could they go back into that water? No, he said, I'm not going to take them this way that would have missed all that. I'm going to take them this way so that they realize the only way to go is forward. They can't, I can't turn back and go into that. I'm not going to go back into that water. I'm not going to go back into that. God has delivered me from that. I must go forward. The, the, the title of today's message is The Point of No Return. The point of no return. I think all of us realize uh, what baptism pictures. It pictures a, a not turning back. I am going forward. But it, it not only is, is pictured through baptism, but it is pictured as we go into the days of unleavened bread because this departure that they, they occurred, it was several days before they got to that position to cross the, the Red Sea. They were in the midst of, of this time after the Passover. And I'd like to ask us to consider some questions today. 
Do we recognize, as God's people, young and old, do we recognize and battle our human nature's desire to return to Egypt? Do we recognize that there are elements in our, in our nature, in uh, the nature that, that God said to Cain, be very, very careful about this, as Mr. Townsend was talking about uh, Abel's, Abel's offering, and, but Cain had, uh, he had, he had some elements there, and, and they were surfacing uh, as, as he was very discouraged by this. Do we recognize and do we battle our human nature's desire to return to Egypt? Secondly, for those who have grown up in the church, do we recognize our desire to go and visit Egypt? <laughs> I guess we could put it that way. Those of, of, of us that have grown up in, in, in families uh, that are uh, God-fearing families and, and which, which try to set a very godly environment, that, that families that have come out of Egypt, you've raised your children in, in a, a, an environment that has left Egypt. Do, do we as, uh, as young people who are in that, uh, in that family environment, do you, do you uh, did I recognize my desire sometimes to go check out Egypt? I want to go check out, just see what it's like. I've, I've never really visited. Well, maybe I've thought about it, but uh, to, to go visit Egypt. What existed at the source of Israel's desire to return? What was present at the source of that desire that they have because Israel wanted to go back. We see several examples. We'll look at those here very briefly in just a second. But Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. And you think, how? How could they have that desire to return to Egypt? But of course, we realize uh, Israel did not have God's Holy Spirit in them. God, God was working with them as a nation, but we've been given God's uh, Holy Spirit. And so we must recognize what was at the source of their desire to return and how does that impact us as God's people that can also creep in and, and exist at the source of our desire to return in some way or another to Egypt. What can exist at the source or the heart of the Israel of God's desire to return to Egypt? Do we recognize that? God warned them against uh, following that, uh, that thought to enter their minds. That's why he so powerfully determined that departure. He wanted to make it so obvious to them, look at what I have done. Look at the honor that I've gained over Egypt by doing this and, and show them we are gone. We are gone from that and here's that water that is covered and there is no way back. Do not even think about it. Look at what I've done. I am taking you here. Believe me, I will get you there. Follow me. Follow me, and I will take you to that destination. We won't turn. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. We won't turn to Deuteronomy 17, but uh, even Deuteronomy 17 talks about, he says, as, as they go to, into the land of Canaan and eventually set up kings. He says, don't go to Egypt. Don't go to Egypt to acquire horses, to multiply horses, because the etern uh, uh, Moses said to them, because the eternal has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Don't go back. Don't go back there. We see another warning here in Deuteronomy uh, 28. It's a couple of years back, I think Mr. Hogberg uh, went into some detail about uh, the blessings and cursings uh, chapter, and I wanted to touch the very end of that here uh, today with respect to this, this situation of God saying, I am getting you out of Egypt. Do not think to go back, but walk in my way. Walk in, my, in that way, uh, because otherwise this will occur. Let's look at verses 58 through 68. Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse Verse 58, Deuteronomy 28, verse 58. If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book and, and that you might may fear this glorious and awesome name, the eternal your God. Again, reflecting upon a, a departure from the ways of, of, of Egypt and, and coming into the truth of God, who he is, his, his glorious name, his awesome power, and his awesome teachings. He says, then the eternal will bring upon you and the descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged plagues. 
You know, as we think about that, we think of the, uh, how this played out for ancient Israel uh, when they began to turn from God. We think about the duality of the end time for Israel and uh, how that will look, the cursings to com- uh, come upon that. Uh, upon that uh, group of people in the end time, but also how it plays out for us, you and, you and me, individually, spiritually, having been delivered from sin, how, how this follows if we willingly allow ourselves to return to that, to desire to return to it, to think on that, to give ourselves over to it. Continuing, verse, verse 60, Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt. Yes, you'll be back in Egypt as, as we turn from God, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness, every plague, which is not written uh, uh, in this book of the law, will the eternal bring upon you until you are destroyed. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you would not obey the voice of the eternal, your God. It shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you, God is going to uh, pluck you up from the land uh, which you go to possess. And the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples. We know of the prophetic reference of of how that is is going to take place uh, during Jacob's trouble. And there uh, you shall serve other gods, which neither you knew your fathers know or knew that wooden stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest. The sole of your foot will not have a resting place, but there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. In the morning you'll say, oh, I wish it were evening. And in the evening, oh, I wish it were were morning because of the sight which your eyes see. Notice verse 68. And the Lord will take you back to Egypt, back to, spiritually for us, that that state of depravity to which we can return. He will bring ultimately, as as we see uh, in prophecy, Israel uh, today, the modern nations that are Israel, he will bring them to this state, back to Egypt in that respect, in in, in a state of depravity, slavery. By the way which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as, as, as male and female slaves, and no one will even buy you, he says. Not a positive outcome. God wants us to go forward. He wants us to head forward. He wants us to kick out any thought, any aspect of leviting that is, an, that is any reference to a desire to anything of Egypt, to anything of sin. He has cleansed us uh, through baptism. He has cleansed us through the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and he has secured us as his people, and he says, go forward. Israel didn't want to go forward. They they did not want to go forward. Let's look at a couple examples of that. We'll read that very quickly. Uh, Exodus 16. Exodus 16, Israel battled this. Every time something hit them, every time. It, Exodus 15 talks about that, uh, uh, contending uh, with Moses with the, with the bitter water. Look, look at verse 3 of chapter 16. Uh, they were in the wilderness of sin at this time. And the children of Israel, Exodus 16, verse 3, said, Oh, I, oh that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Well, who would want to die by the hand of the Lord in the, in the land of Egypt? But they, oh, that that would have been the case. That would have been so much better. I know times were tough then, but oh, that we, we had just uh, died, uh, you know, in the land of Egypt in, in that situation, even if by God's hand. Because back then we sat by uh, pots of meat. We had meat. Oh, we, we ate bread. We ate bread to the full. Yeah, times were hard, but we ate bread to the full. Boy, those were some, some, some good times compared to what we're dealing with now. For you, Moses, you brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Not a forward-looking mentality. Chapter 17, verse 1. Chapter 17, verse 1. The water from the rock situation. They came to... Uh, they set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin... 
and uh, camped at Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. Verse 2, the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the eternal? You know, he, he said he would take care of you. He said he would look after you. He said he would bring you to the land of Canaan. Trust him on this. So the people thirsted there uh, for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you brought us up out of Egypt? We didn't want to leave Egypt. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and all our lives. You're even killing the livestock, Moses. I mean, give us a break. You're killing the livestock with thirst. So Moses cries out to the internal and says, What am I supposed to do here? They're, They're going to stone me. And I'm, and I'm simply trying to, to, fill, uh, to fulfill your will. Uh, let's go back now to uh, Exodus 5. Exodus 5. You know, even the, the book of Hosea talks about how Ephraim is like a, is like a silly dove without sense, that they, they go back to Assyria, they go back to Egypt uh, for trust, but they don't return to the Most High. They, they have a desire for what is known, but there is an uncertainty of the future. And this, this starts to get into uh, our lives, this, this desire for the known. I have a desire to, to be in a world where there are knowns and there, are certain known, there is a some, certain comfort level in, in getting through, even sometimes suffering, in the knowns. But the unknowns are what get very, very challenging for, for me personally. The, the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I said that correctly, right? Not the shrubbery, the bush. Bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I'm really working on these phrases. But, uh, so you know, they, they have this, this, this kind of a mindset. We, we can, we can uh, fall into that ourselves. Remember uh, in Exodus 14, he had said, he had said, uh, didn't we, did, yeah, they had said, isn't, isn't this what we told you uh, in Egypt? Le- leave us alone, Moses. So let's look at that passage now in Exodus 5. Exodus 5. So he had, they had told him this. They didn't want to go, even though they were crying out to the Lord because of, of what they were going through. Uh, Exodus 5. And this is when uh, Pharaoh was telling them, now you need to go out and find your own straw. We're not even going to provide you straw because you need to go out and serve the Lord. So, well, I tell you what, you're not, you don't have enough time. Uh, you've got too much time because you're thinking about going out and serve the Lord. I want you to go out and get your own straw to make your own bricks and we'll keep the, the level at the same of what you need to produce. So, uh, as he said, you're idle. Verse 18, uh, Exodus 5, verse 18. Therefore, go now and work, for no straw shall be given you, yet you shall deliver the quota of the bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble, uh, because this, 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 is not, this is not what we had. It was, it was normal. It was set. Yes, it was oppressive, but we, this was the known. We had to make this many bricks out of the straw that was given us and given us and now you're you Moses because you and Aaron are doing all this you're changing everything and look what's happening to us so they came and and they met Moses and Aaron verse 20 who stood before them and they said to him let the eternal look on you Moses and Aaron and judge because you've made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh the margin renders that you have made our scent to stink before Pharaoh Kind of a a pretty uh, direct statement. You've made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. We're going to be killed because of this. Why are you doing this to us, Moses? At least it, it was we had constancy. When it becomes most difficult for us as God's people, what can happen in our minds? What can we allow to take hold? I, I know what where my mind goes. Uh, this, this, even when things are bad, there's, there's this knowing the constancy and the, the lack of upheaval of, of what a person would want that would cause us, in a sense, to remain in Egypt. I, I can, this is bad, it's awful, but I can at least cope with this. But going into the unknown, going forward and having to trust God and not necessarily knowing what the immediate future holds, whoa. Uh, I mean, this is this is my job. It's not a great it's not a great job, but it is a job. 
Uh, I, I've got this here, I've got this here, I've got this here, I've got this relationship with this individual, but if I stand for what I know is right, uh, and, and I know I need to stand for what is right, or I need to stand for what is right in this job situation or whatever, if I, if I change that, or, or stand up for what is right, I don't know what is, is the constant, and I don't know what's going to happen, I'd rather just, just let's just deal with it. Let's just stay, stay in this mode. It can happen. Uh, let's just keep things at the status quo. The tests and the challenges will come. Israel faced its tests, physical Israel uh, uh, faced its tests, spiritual Israel, you and I, faces, uh, we face our tests. To pass these tests, we need sustenance. We need to think about the, the purpose of the test. We need sustaining power. We need reserves for the energy expended in doing so. We need food. We need the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We need God's words pouring through our minds. We need to be thinking on the things that matter. Yes, this situation is difficult. It's hard. I don't know the immediate outcome of this, but I know that if I do this God's way, in the end, it will work out. Why? Because I believe God. I believe that his way is right. I believe that his way is the way of sincerity and truth. I must go forward, regardless of what may happen in the short term. And as a result, I am strengthened and I am sustained in his spirit through whatever faces me. Brethren, we are frail. We are human. And at some point, if we're not eating of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, starvation begins to set in. And uh, some of you are low blood sugar people. My wife is a low blood sugar person, and she will be the first to tell you that when uh, she has a low blood sugar situation, she can't really think. And, and that tends to be the time that I start asking her questions uh, about all kinds of things. And and I just, I just need to, to eat something, and then I can think. And then, oh, oh, yeah, that's right, low blood sugar. Okay, I'll stop. But, but it is that way. We can become spiritually low blood sugar. We can't think. We can't process. We can't look forward enough to see this is the direction that I need to go if we've got nothing to sustain us. For brethren who choose not to eat of God's word, they over time diminish in their ability to, to think, to to think through things spiritually and to make the choices in moving forward in a right manner. And we end up going into default mode, which is returning to Egypt. Uh, it can happen uh, to any of us, and we can end up pushing that default button. Let's turn to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Our nature <laughs> is... Is, is to, in one respect, our human nature is to want more things. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as soon as one uh, level is met, we, we, we naturally kind of tend to move up to that next level. That's, that's what we need now. Uh, that's one element uh, versus the, I've found in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Not that we are, are not to do our best to increase and, and, and improve in everything, but but that's, that's a, an aspect of our human nature, and it is what we've already talked about as well. It is also the, the nature, the human nature is to seek the comfort and stability of the known. There are, there are probably several of you here that, are, that start to get a little bit antsy when you're, you're settled in a situation and it's going well. It's like, I need another test. I, I need this. This, I, this job is going so well. I, I'm, I'm kind of concerned that I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of just kind of stay in that mode and get comfortable. I need a new challenge. Some of you are that way. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I will raise my hand that I am not that way. I am definitely not that way. I get into a comfortable situation and then I just I kind of start to settle in and I feel like I can I can really function well. I had a good friend that would start to get antsy after a year or two uh, because he needed a new challenge. Uh, he he was a, a different individual and he had his own challenges to face. I know for me the one who seeks comfort and the stability of the known it is a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge when you realize and when I realize I must go forward into the unknown, be it 
the uncertainty of a job situation, losing a job, looking for a new one, uh, whatever the, the example is, being in a situation where we've got to stand for something that's right and, and knowing that it cr create a challenge, uh, dealing with a, a, a sin or something that, uh, you know, we've offended someone and trying to work through that to, to, uh, to heal that situation. Those, those kinds of situations are unknown. They are difficult. They are not givens. It's not a guarantee that the other person is going to receive that uh, in, in a positive way. But I must do this because it's the right thing to do. God, through Moses, was basically saying, you know what, I'm going to bring you from this point and I'm going to bring you here to the promised land. This is where I'm bringing you. Here's this cloud that I'm going to show you by day and this fire that I'm going to show you by night that, that I am with you. I'm going to get you from here to there and I'm going to bring you to this promised land. You need to believe me. Do you really believe me that I'm going to bring you there, that I'm going to take you there be because you need to trust me and you need to follow me? Because you're not going to get there unless you follow me. And you need to follow what I'm telling you to do because I want what is good for you. That's trust. That's belief. Israel struggled with that. Where are we in all that? Where are we in, in that, that ultimate situation of being able to completely give our lives over to God in his way of life and say, I trust you. I am not going to test and tempt you, God. I am going to trust you. I am not going to tempt you with unbelief. I'm not going to allow distrust over whether God has my best interests at heart. And for that matter, I'm not going to allow myself to distrust whether God has the best interests of all of mankind at heart. Because I love you and I see what you have done for me and I see what you're doing for all of mankind. I'm at peace with that and I can go forward. Israel struggled. They struggled with that. And this gets to uh, the source of what we talked about. What, where, was, what, where was the source of that inability to, to move forward and say, yes, yes, Egypt is behind. I am going this direction. Ultimately, it comes to what we talked about, what we're going to talk about here in Hebrews 3. In Hebrews 3. As we read this, and as we think of Israel, may we think of our own lives as, as we're moving forward. We are moving forward as a nation into uncertain times. This last year has been a, a time of uncertainty. Has that unsettled you? Have I allowed it to unsettle me? Think about that. Can we say that in some ways, we've, we've, through all of this, we've become more settled than ever? It's been an unsettling time uh, for me, and it's also been a more settling time than ever as, as I reflect on what is truly important. And, and as we go forward, part of the, the meaning of these days is to help us crystallize the path, the path that, that God's people are on towards the promised land, and that it is a time of uncertainty as we navigate through that. But the, the cloud and the fire are with us, and they are leading us towards that. Do we trust God to, to completely give our lives to him and to say, God, your ways that I'm feeding upon, that I'm eating as I'm eating unleavened bread this week, that I'm thinking on, these are the ways that I must keep focused upon to go forward. Otherwise, I starve. Otherwise, I die uh, in, in the wilderness along with the Israelites who were 20 years and over uh, with, without hope. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Hebrews 3, verse 1. He's, as uh, the author of Hebrews, many of us, we think it's probably uh, Paul here. But I, I like the way he says this because I look at this and I, I say, he's, he's talking to me here. Uh, think about this, Andy. Okay, therefore, holy brethren, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Wow, you know, we, we are partakers as, as we partook of, of, of the bread and wine. We are partakers of the heavenly calling, the kingdom of God, where God's throne is. This calling that has come down from the father of the universe uh, to us, he says, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Consider this being Jesus Christ. 
this individual who was faithful to him, who appointed him. Jesus Christ was faithful to his father all the way to his death, just as Moses was faithful in all of his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house, Jesus Christ has built the house, we've been talking about that uh, in, in recent messages, it has much more honor than the house, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. That's that house uh, in, in, which we, we, uh, in which we reside. And Moses indeed was faithful in all of his house. I said all of his, didn't I? I I'm sorry about that. Uh, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, you and I, we are part of that house as we're headed toward the promised land. But it's, it happens, we continue in that house if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Because now he begins to get into this thing of, ah, I don't, I don't know that we really trust God that you can do this for us. There's, there's a little bit of lack of trust there. There's some distrust. And lack of trust and distrust leads to disobedience. And, and that leads to disqualification. No, to the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Part of the, part of the meaning of, of these days of unleavened bread is to recognize uh, through the plan of God that we have been cleansed by Jesus Christ and we are on this direction towards the end. Hope firm to the end. We have that hope. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the wilderness, uh, in the day of trial, in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, where they tried me, and, and yet they saw my works 40 years. He says, I was angry with that generation. And, they, and, he, and he said, they always go astray in their heart. What, what was at the source in their hearts? He's about to get to this. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they're not going to enter my rest. Beware, brethren, he says to, to you and me, beware, brethren, lest there be in, in any of us an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Is that in us? Is there any little part of our heart, any little bit of leavening, that there's a little bit of unbelief? Because the days of unleavened bread picture this belief, this belief in what has happened for us so that we can go forward in confidence toward the promised land, so that we recognize the sin that was removed by the sacrifice of Christ. We work together with that to remove sin in our lives and, and go forward in belief of where that's taking us. Exhort one another Daily, he says in verse 3, while it's called today, it's now. The time is now, lest any of us be, be hardened by this deceitfulness of sin. Oh, a little bit's okay. A little bit's here is fine. I know I, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to go forward, but I'm, I'm okay with this little bit right here. It's, de it's the deceitfulness of sin. Recognize it. Purge that. Because ultimately, it reflects at the source and what's the source? The source is unbelief. The source is a degree of unbelief that I am not willing to follow God fully, that I am not willing to give my, my heart and my life, my thoughts, and all of that completely to God. I want to keep this little bit here. I want to keep that here. Now he says, don't, don't do that, for we have become partakers. Here, these, these partakers, these individuals who are partakers of the heavenly calling, verse, verse 1. He says in verse 14, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Today, if you will hear his voice, don't, rebel, uh, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. They did not enter, verse 19, because of unbelief. God's saying to us, do you trust me enough? Do you believe me enough to completely yield to what I'm telling you to do? 
Sometimes in the lives of God's people, uh, brethren can all of a sudden uh, find themselves in what they call a crisis of faith. Uh, and that crisis of faith can be a variety of, of, of different things. I, I would submit to you that we must, in those situations, continue to feed on God's word and draw upon God's teaching to, to get through some of these crises that can come, that we reach out and, and get counsel, and, and, and to seek the, the uh, exhorting one another daily, as verse 13 tells us, to, to stay connected to that body of Christ so that we don't let that crisis that can hit uh, begin to take a, a, an emphasis to where, just like with, with Israel, they were getting hit by Pharaoh with the make your own bricks out of your own straw uh, kind of a thing, and they all they can think about is, why is this happening to me and, and you're causing it, Moses, versus saying, no, I'm going to step back from this. God loves me. He has my best interests at heart. I need to use this. I need to appeal to God to help me through it, but I need to use this as an opportunity to trust and rely on him uh, even more deeply because he's taking me from here, here to there. He loves me, and I must trust that he loves me and that he loves all of mankind as, as well as he loves me. Let's go now, if, if you would, to a final passage today as uh, it's, it's listed here in 2 Corinthians 6. We'll read uh, through 2 Corinthians 6 and into a bit of 2 Corinthians 7. This, this whole concept of no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. We don't look back to the Red Sea. We don't look back to try to somehow navigate through these waters, which were the waters of our death. We don't want to go back into that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. God brought me through that and brought me here to take me on to here. Don't look back. Don't look back with regrets, he's saying. So let's, uh, let's now look at 2 Corinthians 6. We'll start in verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6. It's just beautiful passage here uh, from Paul as, as, as he wants us to try to reflect on what, to what God is calling us, to what direction he's calling us, and, and how that works in our day in and day out lives as we, as we have individuals who come to us and say, hey, you really blew it here, Burnett. Uh, <laughs> you really blew it here. As I reflect on something that I did, I really blew it here. I need to, I need to focus on this. Uh, how, do I go, and how do I navigate forward as, as we see our own humanity? Look at verse 16. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? We don't want anything of Egypt. We've left that behind. I don't want to connect on that level with Egypt. You, you and I, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'm going to dwell in them and, and walk among them, the, the cloud and the fire. But now he dwells in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ has made us unleavened. Uh, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Eternal. Don't touch what is unclean, and I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you. You, are my, you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, do we believe that promise? That, that God considers us sons and daughters. He, he considers us his people, that God dwells in us walks among us, that we are part of the temple of God. He says, as we reflect upon all of that and adding, re reflecting upon what Jesus Christ has done for us to make that happen, he says here in verse 1, so therefore let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. All of it. Is, is there any little bit that we're holding, to which we're holding on? perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He says, open your hearts to us, verse 2. We, we've wronged no one. We've corrupted no one. We've cheated no one. I don't say this to condemn, for, for I've said before that you're in our hearts to die together and to live together. And that's, that's the way we are with one another here. We're, we're in each other's hearts to die together and live together as God's people. This is, this is the stuff that really matters. Paul says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful 
in all the tribulations that we have. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside fears. Um, nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Paul's first letter had it, it, it made a real, uh, a very positive impact on the church. And, and Titus came and, and, and let Paul know the degree to which uh, the Corinthian brethren had responded to, to Paul's uh, letter in 1 Corinthians. And not only by his coming, but, but the comfort with which he was comforted in you, he says to the brethren, when he told us of your, your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. And there, here we come to a passage that, uh, which we'll... we'll think on here as we begin to wrap things up. Verse 8, he says, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, you know, he had, he had to write this letter, 1 Corinthians, you think about all the things that he had to nail them for, the things that were off here or there, uh, we, could, we could go through those, but you know most of them, brethren, all kinds of problems the brethren in Corinth uh, were, were experiencing. He says, you know, it was difficult uh, to do this, and he said, I know I made you sorry with my letter, he said, but I don't regret it. But he said, I did regret it because I hated to have to do it. It, it was not an easy thing. Paul, in, in a sense, as, as we're talking about this, this story, Paul, in going to the promised land, Paul, in remembering his responsibility and his accountability before God as the apostle, he knew he needed to say what needed to be said. And he knew it wouldn't be fun, happy times, as he said those things. But he knew his responsibility in the body of Christ was to do that and to do that in love, so he did it. And, and, and he, he, he regretted, he hated having to do that, but he knew that it must be done. He says, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. And he wasn't saying that, you know, uh, sarcastically, because he begins to say what that sorriness, sorriness, Sor sorrow, sorrow. I'm sorry, sor the, being sorry, the situation of being sorry, what, what that, that was a temporary thing because of what happened. Verse 9, he says, now I rejoice. Not, not that you were made sorry, boy, I really got a kick out of seeing you just really break down and be sorrowful. I, I just, you know, no, he's not saying that. I, I didn't rejoice that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow, that, that you were made sorry in a godly manner. Your sorrow led to change. It led to repentance. It led to going forward in a right direction. And, and he says, because in the end, when we think about that, that he recognized that you and I, that, that we might suffer loss in nothing. And then he makes this statement, a, a very familiar passage. Godly sorrow... This is the sorrow where the person recognizes the error of his ways and turns. Godly sorrow produces repentance. That kind of turning, he says, is what leads to salvation. And that is not something to be regretted. That's the, the sorrow that turns into joy. That's the, that, that's the sorrow that doesn't continue. It's the sorrow that turns to joy, but the sorrow of the world produces Death. The sorrow of the world produces death. I think of uh, godly sorrow versus a sorrow of the world. One, con one concept of a, of a return to Egypt kind of thing is, is regret over actions. I mean, we, we do some things sometimes that we regret. I, I did this. I, I, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. But, but Sometimes it's just simply the sorrow of, of then, okay, then here come the consequences, the sorrow of experiencing uh, what they have to experience because of the consequences. And, and maybe even a degree of sorrow over the actions. Sometimes that's the case. But that even a sorrow over the actions, not necessarily just the consequences. I, know, I think sometimes when we read this, the sorrow of the world produces death is because, uh, you know, the person just thinks about the consequences. Oh, I got caught. Uh, that's an element of it, I think, but, but there is also a sorrow of the world that recognizes the consequences of the actions and, and is sorry that, that the individual did it, but it doesn't, it doesn't cause anything to happen as a result. We, they, they stay in the same mode. They still stay in Egypt, and they don't leave Egypt, but they, they're sorry about it, but it's constant. 
It's constant. It's status quo. Trusting and believing in God to go forward from that is dangerous water. Uh, dangerous water. Dangerous. I'm not going back to the water. Dangerous land. Walking over new unexplored territory. Am I going to get through this? This is comfortable right here. And, and I, oh, I did it. I did this. I thought this. I, I, I said this. I shouldn't have said this. Yeah, I know I do this. I'm sorry about that. Oh, here are the consequences. But it just stays the same. It stays the same. Do you have anything like that in your life that tends to kind of stay the same? This, this, is, what, this, is, what he's, this is the sorrow that, that produces death, ultimately. The sorrow which needs, that, that leads nowhere. It's the sorrow that, that has permeated, the leavening that's permeated everywhere and, and leavened the whole lump because the person chooses not to remove the leavening. That, that, that's the sorrow that leads to death. But this is not the way of the spiritual Israelite. This is not the way of you and me. Look at verse 11. This is what uh, the, the godly sorrow does. Let's read verse 10 again. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance. For you were made uh, to sorrow in a, sorry in a godly manner. Uh, this repentance that leads to salvation. It is something that's not to be regretted. For, for observe this very thing, he says, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. Here is the godly way to sorrow. Look at what diligence it produced in us. What clearing of yourselves to turn from that. And, and the clearing of yourselves. The, 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 the godly confidence. Look, God is helping me with this. I am, I am actively participating in this. I am going in a forward direction. Now, what indignation at sin itself. What fear, what reverence to, to God. What vehement desire to go forward. What zeal, what vindication. In all things, he says to the Corinthian brethren, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And he was very, very encouraged by that. So therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, speaking of the individual back in 1 Corinthians 5, I think, uh, but for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our, uh, uh, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. In thinking about this, and, I, and as I reflect upon uh, some of the situations in my life, I'll speak to the teens just briefly. Uh, as a teen, I observed uh, some of the things that, that uh, the lifestyle, the experience, the opportunities that I did not get to enjoy uh, because of being in the church. Uh, and, and many of those things were great opportunities, good things, but, but because, uh, I, I, because I was part of the church, it prevented some opportunities uh, to be presented my way. And sometimes I look back with a little bit of regret as a teen and, and a little bit of a looking back to Egypt, even though I basically grew up in the church, of, you know, look at, look at what I might be, what I'm missing, what my other friends are getting to experience because of, you know, for me, the, a huge thing was just the, the limitations of not being able to be involved in Friday night and Saturday activities. Uh, it wasn't more, and those things seemed so important at the time to me, and it wasn't until maybe even, I mean, not even as long as a year afterwards, as here I was at college then and a freshman, and, and looking back on that, that high school uh, situation, and, and I began to, to realize, you know what, that, that really wasn't that big a deal. God, God has blessed me so much to give me his truth and, and his wisdom uh, moved towards getting baptized uh, that year and, and began to grasp this stuff was little stuff. Man, it seems so big and so important at the time. But, but I began to see clearer and clearer, more and more clearly, that, that that's Egypt. That's Egypt. Uh, and, and now, you know, I think about all these friends that I was, you know, so concerned about how they would view me because of, uh, you know, not being able to do this and that. And, and you know how often I think about my high school, uh, my high school classmates? I, I, I don't remember when I last thought of one of them. I don't remember the last time I contacted one of them. I don't know, maybe, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, very rarely. Uh, that, that is behind me. And, I'm, and again, I'm not, I'm not 
belittling my, my high school classmates. I, I'm just saying that I, I moved on. I, I moved on and I, I strove to, to get that focus, but it was so important that, at the time. For us uh, who are parents here that are raising our children in the faith, uh, our children did not start out in Egypt. They didn't start out in Egypt. They started out in a godly home. It's important for us to accept the responsibility to teach our children what Egypt is. Do your kids know what Egypt is? Do they know uh, its lures? Do they know its lies? And do we guide our children in the way, instructing them how to avoid the, the, the pleasures, the lure of the pleasures of sin for a season? Because they will reach the age of accountability, and they will need to make choices as, as, they, as they reach maturity. Sin, the old way, the natural way of thinking. Brethren, we're on a lifelong trek. We're on a lifelong trek for the kingdom of God. We're moving forward, and we ain't looking back. We need sustenance. We eat in unleavened bread this week. Unleavened bread doesn't picture an event. It pictures a process, similar to how the Feast of Tabernacles pictures a process. Last great day, a process, a time period. While doing so this week, we think of its meaning. We think of eating what sustains us spiritually, not filled with the deception, the lies that are out there in Egypt, uh, the passing away along with the lust of it, of this, of this world. Indeed, instead, we, we recognize how we must leave that behind. We put out anything, we put out anything that is leavened in our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. This week, as you and I commune with God, may we think on these things. Do we trust him to bring us to the promised land? Do we? Do we trust him to bring us to the promised land? Do we trust in God's desire and his ability, his ability through his plan of salvation to give all mankind the opportunity to do so, to come to that promised land, or do we doubt? Do we allow what Hebrews calls an evil heart of unbelief to reside in our minds? That's default mode. That's Egypt. That's return to Egypt. That's a desire to maintain the status quo. At least I knew what I was dealing with during those times. I could rely on myself. I don't want to have to trust in someone, have faith that someone can bring me to something 